Good morning again. Happy Sabbath. You know, I don't really need this, so I think I can set this down without making any noise. You do. I can't help but think in my old trucking days with all this talk about mountains and faces and places I've seen and maps and then somebody talking about their parents coming here from California taking a week to get here. That's really the way to do it because back in my rebel days I used to go out to California from New York in three days, load, unload, be back in three days. It is a week. That's hard on the body. You're not supposed to run quite that hard. Anyways. It's good to see everybody. It's wonderful to be here. So, I uh, titled this little talk today, We Must Have a Higher Standard. You believe that's true? Yes. Okay, good. I like people that can speak up, okay? It uh, encourages me. Uh, when I when I talk to people that are asleep, I just want to go to sleep myself. <laughs> All right. So, anyways, if I had a subtitle, it may sound something like this: Christ's faith and His love is the way. Christ's faith and His love is the way. If I had a sub subtitle, it may be: True reverence is revealed by obedience. Do you hear that? That's worth hearing again. True reverence is revealed by obedience. I'm going to read you a little something from uh, Evangelism 695. It said, Had Adventists, after the great disappointment in 1844, now you got to understand, Adventists, there wasn't Seventh day Adventists back at this time. In 1844, there was a worldwide movement. I'm saying a worldwide movement, okay? The people were waking up to the scriptures of Daniel and Revelation and realizing there was a time that we were, we were in the end time. It was beginning. And they were studying the scriptures and they, they misread some things. They thought that Jesus was coming to cleanse the earth. But there was something else that had happened. And the people that understood this are the ones that after this great disappointment, because you, can you imagine, I mean, many people didn't even dig up their fields. They, they let their houses go. They gave everything away. They knew Jesus was coming, and when he didn't come, they were broken. They were a broken people. Well, many of them, many of them lost their faith. And th these are people that all came together from, I mean, you're, you're talking um, what they call Adventists and what they had uh, Presbyterians, Baptists, you know, Methodists. All of these people. And many of them, like I say, lost their faith. Lost their way, so to speak, after this great disappointment. Can you imagine what it would be like? Just think about it. How intense if you just knew that you knew that Jesus was coming and he didn't come. How broken would you be? Well, there was a small company that came out of those people. And they became Seventh-day Adventists. This is something they took everything from everybody, all the truth, and dug in. And, and, and God birthed this church, the Seventh-day Adventist church. So this, this Seventh-day Adventist church has a birth, a birthmark, a beginning. That God created this church to do something. And I personally have read the, um, the mission statement. And... Um, when I got here, the mission statement, I only got here two months ago. I've been off in New York, for you that don't know me. When I got here, the mission statement didn't, um, it didn't have an Adventist fingerprint on it. I think it's been changed now. It, 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 it sounds a little better, and I like it. Because if we're like every other church, then why are we here? We might as well join them. Right? I mean, if we're no different than the Baptists, why don't we just join the Baptists? So I, I wrote my own personal mission statement. I wrote this, you know, a few days ago. I just want you to see what you think. I think all of us should have a personal mission statement. 
I mean, the church has a mission statement, but we as individuals should too. And mine is this. Lord, help me to give the trumpet that certain sound. Allow me to preach the gospel with such fire that I am just a mouthpiece of your Holy Spirit. May I arrest the people's attention and direct it towards the most holy place where the three angels' messages are crying out to a lost and dying world. The Lord is coming. We are to be a people prepared and ready. Amen? Amen. At Adventist, after the great disappointment in 1844, and let's turn to First Peter. You're, you're already in John, First John, so it's just a couple pages backwards here. First Peter 4 and 7. And what does it say? 4 and 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Let's just jump down to 17, verse 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin where? At the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Had Adventists, after the great disappointment in 1844, held fast their faith and followed a united, had followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel, Revelation 14, 6 to 12, and in power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming it to the world, they would have seen the salvation of God. The Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. The work would have been completed, and Christ would have come ere to receive his people to their reward. But in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Thus the work was hindered, and the world was left in darkness. Had the whole Adventist body united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history. Is this a solemn message? Do you believe so? I think it is. We brothers and sisters need to get together so that we can get it right. And the only way we're going to get it together is to be looking to Jesus for everything. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the way he, he told us to overcome the same way he overcame. And that way was through his heavenly Father, right? Yeah. Everything he did, he did because of, of the Father. Not in and of his own will, right? Yeah. All right, 1 John 4 and uh, 1 and 2, we just read. I want to read it again. Believe, beloved, believe not every spirit. What is that saying? Believe not every spirit. We need to question things, maybe? But try the spirits, whether they be of God. We have to, we have, everything has to get, get in line with the Bible. Amen. If it's not in line with the Bible, it's got to go, right? This is the way we have to study the Bible. If we don't study the Bible that way, if we just read it like a novel, it's never going to mean anything to us. The Bible has to be real to us. We have to come at it with... Lord, you know, I want to know this thing. And if I'm doing something that, that, that doesn't line up with this, it needs to go. Right? I mean, if you love your father, your mother, would you do something that, that displeases them? Or would you want them to be pleased? This is what we're talking about here. Because many false prophets are going out into the world. What are false prophets? They teach lies, right? A false gospel. So we're talking about a false gospel here. And then what's, what is the next verse? So it's telling us to beware of a false gospel. Here's the next verse. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. What flesh is this talking about? It's 4561 in your uh, in your. Uh, Concordance, and it's the word sarks. Okay? And what do you think that word means? Ricky? Natural man. 
But, but what does it mean? I mean, my flesh what? My condition? Carl, my Carl, human, carnal Carl nature. This flesh. This is what God conquered. Sin, the death, death, and the devil in this equipment, like you and I have. Anybody that tells you different, it's a false gospel. Jesus was not born to a perfect woman. He had a mother like you and I. Right? So what flesh did he have? Partly his mother's flesh. Right? All right. Fully human and fully God. That is a mystery, isn't it? All right, four, let's go to 15. Four and, four and 15, y'all there? Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. Do you hear that? God is love. Now, a lot of people use Google, and I'm going to shut and turn my ringer back on just so I can have noise here, and hopefully nobody will call me at this moment. But I, I want to prove a point, because there's things that we have today that we use as common tools, like Google. Okay? Google, everybody thinks, is just a wonderful thing. There's people at Google that are uh, upset about, they're offended by the word family. Have you heard this? No. Offended by the word family. I'm not surprised. Yeah, because it's, it's worldly, right, brother? <laughs> Come on. I'm not even going to go there. But anyways, let's, um, I, I want to I pick up a word, because there's a word here that says God is love. And um, what love are we talking about? God. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. It's agape love. But if I ask Google, God is love. Love's great God is Eros. You hear what comes up? Eros. Oh, my. Wow. <laughs> That's what comes up. What did it say? Great God's love is Eros. What is Eros love? It's erotic love. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is that God's love? No. No. See, we have to understand that we need to dig in. And, and, and these are great tools. I mean, you can use Google. I'm not saying Google's the devil, blah, blah, blah. I'm saying just like your GPS. The GPS is a good tool, okay? But it's, it's not the absolute. I've had, let me tell you, I probably got more miles backing up than most people got going forward. I mean... The last truck I sold had a million seven hundred fifty thousand miles on it. I had it brand new. Okay, um, I know what I'm talking about about traveling these roads. Trust me. Yeah, I I remember one time when I was a very young fellow. I was 18 years old. I thought I knew everything. I pulled down into Pittsburgh. I was talking about Pennsylvania. Went through one of the bridges. That's I always called that city the the city of low bridges and leaning telephone poles. <laughs> I mean, you have to be careful because you're going to crack one if you get the drive where you're supposed to. Anyways, I was very young, thought I knew everything. I was trying to find a, a place where I was supposed to be, and I missed my turn, and I saw this turn, didn't see that it said five-ton weight limit road. As soon as I turned on it, I don't know where all these cops came from, <laughs> but I mean, it's like instant daylight. <laughs> cops were everywhere. And I got humbled real quick, let me tell you. This guy that thought he was 10 feet tall and bulletproof was like, uh, I didn't know what to do. But you know, they let me go. They could have given me some serious tickets. They could have done some bad stuff to me. But my point is this. There's, there's things all around us that, that can be very good tools, but they are not the absolute. There's only one absolute, and that's Jesus Christ. Okay? He is the way, the truth, and the life. And this is his book. And we can't study this in a haphazardly way. We can't read it like a novel. We have to dig in and study and find out. Because every word that we find here from 16 to 18, the word love, is agape. Okay? It's the word agape. Go look up, go look it up for yourself. It's G26. Alright, I'm going to continue on at, beginning at 16. And we have known 
and believed that the love that God hath to us, God is love. Now it says God is love. It doesn't say it's an attribute of God. It says God is love. He does everything he does because he is love. And he that dwelleth in love, and all these words are agape, dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because, because as he is, so are we in this world. Do you believe that? That's some pretty big words right there. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in agape. Every single one of those words are agape. I, they've tried to define agape. I don't think we can humanly define the word agape. How do you define such a word? We're going we're to try to attempt to, to, to dig into some of this. But... Um, Let's turn our Bibles to 1 John 5 and 1. You're all you're right there, so. All right, you ready? Verse, chapter 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begot loveth him also that is begotten of him. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Yes. Hey, what does that say? Does it say that we love our brothers and sisters even if we disagree with them? Yes. Huh? Yeah. Ooh. Do we stand up for our brothers and sisters even if we disagree with them? Yeah. How else are we going to get this message going and get it across? How's it going to happen? If we can't come together, right, and show this, this love, how's the world going to get it? How are they going to know? Because of, in my opinion... But you didn't come here to hear. I don't see the church as any different than the world. Do you see the church as any different than the world? Verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. Are his commandments grievous to you? I hope not. Let's move on down to verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is where? In his Son. And that and he that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not what? Hath not life. Let's turn to, let's turn to regular John. Let's go back left. The last gospel, John 14. John 14. No, I wasn't John 13. I wrote down the wrong one. John 13 and 35. All there? By this shall all men know that ye are my what? Disciples. Disciples, if you have what? Love. Love one to another. Love one to another. And, and this love, this love word here is what? Agape. Agape. Is it possible for you to have agape in and of yourself? No. no. Ooh. What are we talking about here? There's some serious implications right here. Isn't there? By this shall all men know. Do you hear the work being done? This is how the work shall be done. You hear it? By this all men know that ye are my disciples if you have a gape one to another. How are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? Unless we let go. We gotta let go. You know how you catch a monkey? You gotta catch a monkey? You put you put it in a bottle. You put his favorite food in a bottle, right? And he'll stick his hand in there and you'll grab that food. You can just tie the bottle to a tree and you got him. You know why? Because he's so greedy. 
he won't let go. And that fist won't come back up out of the bottom. And you caught your monkey. How, how easy does the devil catch people? How easy do we get mad at our brother and sister for stupid things? Really? I mean, we're talking about agape love. This is not something that comes natural to us. We have got to get this. We have to receive it from outside of ourselves from God. And I can't receive something if I'm not letting go of what I'm already holding on to. Right? How, how did those people in the upper room, what, what did they do? What did the Bible say? It said that they had what? All things in common. They were all as one. Very many different views and ideas about how things are supposed to be, weren't they? But they finally came together, didn't they? For what? How did they come together? Under the banner of Emmanuel. It was no more about me. It was about God. Not about being first. They finally come to realize that the master washed my feet. Can you imagine that? Think about Jesus serving you. This is, we're talking about the commander in chief of all heaven. We're talking about somebody that cannot lie. We're talking about somebody that speaks and it is. And how did the people treat him? Who were the people that he had trouble with? Church people, right? Church people. And where was he anyway? Where was he anyway? If I get too loud, I'm sorry. I get a little excited. He was in church anyway, even though these are the people he had problems with. Because he had a message to give, and he was showing the way, the truth, and the life. He says, in my Father's kingdom, it's not like this. He who is least is the greatest. He turned everything we think upside down. The devil says, here, walk out of this prison and be free. Do whatever you want. God says, walk into this prison and be free. Does that make sense? We have to have this agape love. It's not ours. We have to receive it so that we can finish the work. That's the only way the Holy Spirit is going to move. He's not going to move with a bunch of people that are selfish like monkeys and got their hands all in the jar and won't let go. Listen, you of your own children, you're sitting at the table and you got a plate full of food and your son says to you, I want some more. Are you going to give him more? No, you're going to tell him, eat what he's got, I'll give you plenty more. Right? Let's turn to Romans. Romans 5. Romans 5. We get in verse 6. We all there? I don't hear pages turning. You guys are quick. I love that. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Do you believe He's given? Do you believe He's given to us? Amen. Is the Bible promise that did Jesus would send the Comforter? Yeah. Did He send the Comforter? For when ye were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet pre-adventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But here we go. Here's the verse. Verse 8. But God commendeth his agape, G26, toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So what we were his enemies, right? But he laid down his life. He was tried and tempted like no one could ever be. Because he had power like no one ever had. But he never accessed that power. Because if he did, he would have disqualified himself to be your savior. So he overcame exactly how he's asking you to overcome. With agape love given to him by his father. Because he followed his father. We need to follow our father. 
Do we not? Amen. Let's turn to Revelation. Are we in agreement with God? I hope we're in agreement with God. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. <clears throat> chapter 3 and verse 17. Y'all there? Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That's pretty bad, isn't it? Are we in agreement with God when He calls us these things, or do we say no? Do you know what wretched is? Wretched is very unhappy, ill, and unpleasant. That's the definition. It's only found in two places in the Bible. Two places. This word. Huh? Yeah, Romans 7, 24. The word is G5005. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it for you, but that's where it's at. O wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? You know, back in Paul's day, that was a way of execution. They would take a dying or a dead corpse and wrap it to you. And that dead corpse would kill you. How would you like to die that way? Oh, wretched man. Miserable. Being in a pitiable state of distress or unhappiness as from want or shame. Miserable. You know, when God says these things, we got to get down on our knees and say, Lord, help us. Right? When God says something, no matter what it is, we need to listen to Him and follow Him. He says that we're poor. What does poor mean? Poor to me, I'll give you an ag agricultural uh, illustration, is, is barren and unproductive. Barren and unproductive. Naked. Naked. Destitute of protection. God is longing to protect us, but we go out without protection. Why do we go out without protection? Amen, we need to ask. I want to read you a little quote. This is not... Uh, I don't even know who this guy is, but he hit it right on. His name's Paul Washer. I don't know if it's his own quote or something he got from somebody else, but this is, a, this is very good. <coughs> In modern day evangelism, this precious doctrine of regeneration <coughs> has been reduced to nothing more than a human decision to raise one's hand, walk an aisle, or pray a sinner's prayer. As a, as a result, the majority of Americans believe that they have, been, they have been born again, even though their thoughts, words, and deeds are a continual contradiction to the nature and will of God. It's a pretty heavy statement. It's pretty sobering. I think we need to listen to the Lord and confess our sin before Him. Let's look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 11 and 32. Y'all there? But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be con condemned with the world. Chastened. What does that mean, chastened? He's purifying us from our faults, right? He's chasing us. Chasing us. <laughs> Jesus showed righteous indignation in the cleansing of the temple, right? And he was upset, right? And he drove out 
some of the people, the little children ran to him, right? What was that righteous indignation? What did he say? It was for his father's house, right? It wasn't for him personally. It was for his father's honor. See the difference in righteous indignation? Our problem is pride. When, when we have somebody come up here and speak, okay, 